Alright you guys, this is episode 25 of Inner Demons. I'm going to get straight into it, but before I do, you already know what time it is, man. I'm going to take care of a little bit of household business. This one's going to be quick, man. So, check it out, man. I just want to extend my appreciation to all those of you who participated in the raffle. It was a good raffle. Um, somebody else knew one. You know who you are, Farmero. Congrats to Farmero for winning. Um... Day Wonder has always participated. He finally won a pair of Jordans. I don't think he's ever wore Jordans before in his life. So he's gonna be uh he's gonna be banging them things, man. They're cool. It's a cool pair too. I like them. I got a pair just like them myself. Anyway, so you know the other thing that 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 I want to say that I said throughout the raffle is, man, I wish there was more of you that could win. Um, I almost feel guilty when it's like only one person wins the raffle. That's why I threw in a book. I threw in a, a, a couple more pairs of shoes. Congrats out to Britannia that won those. She won two pairs. <laughs> she uh, she decided she wanted to keep both pairs, which is, hey, she won both, and she, she got to keep both, man. Um, you know, so somebody's got a different pair to wear um, throughout the week, man. You know what I'm saying? They ain't Jordans, but they were free. And, um, you know what I mean? They're, they're comfortable shoes. Anyway, so congrats to everybody that participated. Congrats to uh, Jason for winning the book. Um, and like I said, man, I appreciate everybody that participated. We're going to keep running those raffles. They're for you guys. Um, I got a lot more pairs of, uh, of Jordans sitting in the closet, man. And I do got that connect, you know what I'm saying, that comes through with the Jordans, man, authenticated, we ain't fucking selling no Korean, uh, made in China knockoffs over here, man, they're straight authenticated, anyway, so, without further ado, man, let me get, let me get straight into it, we got a lot of content that's supposed to be dropping tonight, we got a Q&A, we have, hopefully, I'm gonna get this other thing that I've been talking about, this other, I'll call it a profile, on the dark side of social media and then i'm going to be doing something else which i'm not going to really put out there because i don't want i don't want to give nobody no no uh no content food man you know what i'm saying um but i'll be dropping i got a bunch of shit lined up for you guys man it's all it's all they're all they're all bangers man it's all good content you know what i mean so i'm going to try to get it out as fast as i can while this shit's still current so, you know, I'm going to be busy for the next two, three weeks, man. Anyway, let me let me get straight into this next one without further ado, man. So, episode 24. I believe I had just told you guys about, you know, the incident where I ended up getting caught up with the homie. I ended up getting caught for a robbery. But Frisco came through for your boy, man. Like I said, Frisco has a reputation. It's always been a liberal county. And they came through this time. I caught a robbery, dead bang in the act, and they kicked it. They dumped the case and let me go back on a parole violation, which I was more than happy to oblige, man. I'll take that 12 months. That's what they gave me. So I would go back to San Quentin, but this time I would go back, not as a new commitment, but as a parole violator. Didn't know what to expect. I've been to Quentin, so I knew the routine, but I just didn't know what to expect as far as being a parole violator. I didn't know nothing about Morrissey, about screening. I didn't know nothing about none of that shit, but it would be coming. Um, so, you know, the, the one thing I will say, though, is for, I, I want to say for at least the first three or four times I came back on parole violations, I slipped through. I managed to slip through West Block. They didn't catch the fact that I was validated. Years later, even when I caught my second number, whenever I would roll up to Quentin, motherfucker come up on the bus with the clipboard, John Mendoza, where you at? 
and I usually they throw me in the cage. I'd be right there, and they take me straight to the dungeon, right, right back to the oil. But you know, being that I was just, I was still kind of like, I was still on guppy status, man. I was still fairly new to the system in '92 that that I slipped through. The, the goon squad gang intel didn't catch it. So when I got there, I got to go out to West Block and I got to play with everybody else, man. Got to chill with the homies. And I had a routine over there where basically I had the program down packed where I go in the West Block when they run us in for chow. And if I was on the fourth tier, I go all the way up. To, I go up to four, to the fourth tier. I wait for them, the COs to come up there, start pulling the bar. And then I climb down. I climb over the side of the rail and climb down all the way down to the first tier and then I go out back out to West Block to the to the yard out there I mean I would post up by the classrooms for those of you that are familiar with it you know what I'm talking about I'd post up by the classroom and then I'd wait for Badger section to come out Badger section would come out I go out there and I chill with all the homies from Badger section when Badger section got ready to run in they got ready to run them back in I go back by the classroom I chill for a minute over there until they ran out Donner section then Alpine sections I stayed out all fucking day man um, until like 2 o'clock until the laundry workers were out there and then I kick it with them cats before eventually I would have to lock it up back in my cell in West Block you know the other thing I didn't mention the first time when I came through Quinn as, as a new commitment and some of you guys have actually asked me about this is the 1989 earthquake. I was there in San Quentin when that motherfucking earthquake hit. The 1989, I don't know what they call it, the Loma Prieta earthquake. I was right there in West Block, Bayside. On my gate with my fucking mirror stuck out through my bars. And I was watching the tear. First of all, the gunners, they all, all you could hear is keys. Motherfuckers. The gunners took off outside and all the, the 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 seals that worked in the unit, they all fucking went outside, which I probably would have too if I would have been working there. I ain't going to stay back in there and get crushed by a million pounds of concrete and rebar uh, with the inmates. You know what I mean? Fuck the inmates. Uh, and that's what they did. But I was right there. I was, I had my mirror out and I was watching, man. And the fucking tear looked like water. I'm serious. It looked like fucking water. I looked out there one time, I looked back at my celly and I was like, bro, this motherfucker's coming down, homie. This tier is coming down. And we were on the fourth tier. You know, I, I had it in my mind that we were just gonna ride that shit all the way down to the first tier and somehow be okay with the fifth tier on top of us, man. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Anyway, so. Like I said, man, I got to slip through for about two weeks before the goon squad would eventually show up at my gate early one morning before any movement, 5 a.m., tapped on my gate and it's like, Mendoza, roll it up. You know where the fuck you going. You know what time it is, man. And they take me to, at that time, it was East Block. Now, the other thing, man, 1992, man, was a different, it was a different environment. Prison was, it was completely different. I cannot emphasize that enough. It was nothing like it was in the late 90s into the millennium. There were fucking... San Quentin was packed out with Northaniels. There were fucking Northaniels everywhere, man. East Block, in the oil, there were fucking... It, it was... The six yard, when we were when I would finally make it out to the yard for the, for the very first time out there, was packed. We were packed like sardines. There were so many homeboys out there that we had to we had to do two machinas because we couldn't we everybody couldn't get in formation and do the machina. So we just had to run two machinas, man. That's how many of us were out there. There wasn't that many people that were dropping out. The morale was up. The morale was peaking, man. It was all about carnalismo, unity. The spirit was 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 on fire back in those days, man. Straight up. I don't know how else to articulate it, man. It was different. I watched it wither over the next couple years. I seen the 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 changes in in the movement, the 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 changes in the in the morale, 
And then you started to see a lot of homies just fall off, man. It was like a crumbling fucking... It was crazy. It was crazy, man. But anyway, so, you know, Goon Squad eventually show up. They show up to my gate. They take me over to, uh, at that time, I want to say it was East Block. This was the first time I got to go to East Block and chill over there with... Uh, um, at that time, there was only one C over there, and that, that was Sal from Salinas. I want to say they called him Gangster. I forget his last name, but that was the first time I really got to be in the presence of a C. Uh, Marty Lomas came through there from San Jose. J-Cat, good dude, but lightweight J-Cat. Um, and I believe Chico, Robert Rose, came through there, who I would become real tight with over the years man i mean i had a lot of love and respect for chico even when he let me down with the situation uh when the situation happened with peewee from from gilroy no 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 offense towards peewee that you know my mind at that time was somewhere else peewee was a major target for us when we were active um he was one of the 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 catalyst or at least he was getting the blame for being a catalyst for uh, the the rogue and our members that were pulling away from the collective. So it is what it is, man. You know, and just I, I don't want to get off track here, but Chico Chico had an opportunity to hit Pee Wee on the six yard, and he got with him. He got it in, but he just bombed on him. And and C's don't NF members. At least the way I've been educated, we don't do that. It, it should have been with a weapon. It should have been, a, a, he should have set an example out there, especially for an individual like Pee Wee. But there was a lot of other shit going on. That shit with Copas was going on. There was a following that that Chico didn't want. Copas had his following there. There were a bunch of C's that were behind Copas. Um, you know what, matter of fact, I think this came later, but anyway, whether it did or not, you know, Chico, his whole thing was he just wanted to get the fuck off the yard because there was kind of, there was a split going on with the Salinas regiments. Anyway, that's another story. We will be talking about that later on, but so, you know, I get to the, I get to East Block. It's the first time I get to be around any any kind of death row inmates. I'd always heard that they were in San Quentin. And occasionally when I was out there in West Block, I'd see some get escorted by. And just like everybody else, you know what I mean? I was looking uh, uh, somewhat fascinated by the fact that this dude is on death row. I used to see him walk by. I think, matter of fact, one time I think I seen Tookie walk by way back in 92. But when I got to East Block, this is the first time that I was actually around him. And, you know, it was a, it was different for me coming back to San Quentin from the first time I, obviously, the first time I got there in 89. Because now I was, I was somewhat laced up. I was educated. I was an NR member. I had a little bit of time under my belt. Susanville, you know, just that whole, everything I had been through in Susanville, it, it, it started to, to turn me into the individual that I would become years later. So that, that transformation was was already slowly it was it was taking uh it was in the process, man. Um so eventually I will go to I will go to committee. That's what you have to do. Whenever you whenever you go to a hole or an ad say, whatever you, for those of you that don't know what the hole means, the oil for you Mexican metatins. <laughs> um Whenever you go to, to an ad say, you get to a new prison, you have to go to classification. Classification is basically a, it's a, it's like a panel of individuals. You got a counselor in there, somebody from mental health. You have somebody in there from uh, IGI. You're going to have like the assistant warden and some other cats. And this panel, you know, they'll, they'll ask you questions like, do you have any enemies? No. Do you? Uh, who do you program with? Um, I'm a northerner. I'm from Northern California. Okay, you want to go to the Northern Mexican Black Yard? You want to go uh, to the Integrated Yard? Where you want to go? I'd, I'd rather go to the the Northern Mexican Black Yard. Um, they'll ask you things like that. 
and you know they'll they'll basically just give a, a an overview of what's going on with you. You know, it's, it's, I see here that you're coming back on on a, your first parole violation. You, you haven't been to screening or more or board yet, um, so you're basically just here until we figure out what we're gonna do with you and send you. You know, are you validated? I don't know. That's for you to find out. Um, so that's what it is, and. In order to go to yards, you got to go to classification. You have to go to committee. So you can't refuse committee. Not if you're active. Anyway, so, and then when you go to committee, you always get that 128 chrono. And those, your, your 128 chrono, when you're active, you're functioning, that's like, those are your fucking papers, man. That's like your passport. You have to have, you, you have to keep your 128 your 128 chrono man and it says everything in there from like what you were convicted for convicted of a little bit about your 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 history it's gonna have your number all all the identifying uh all the vitals you know your age your birth date your name it might even have your moniker in it and then it, you know it say it 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 have something in there about you being a pro violator or a new commitment so you know your 128 Chronos, man, those right there, you always want to keep those. Because when you go to committee and then when you, when the homies get at you or whenever, you know, if you're not a Norteño or if you're a Wood or if you're a Sureño or whatever, whatever group you belong to, your people are going to ask to see that 128 chrono. That 20, that's going to get you clear right there. And, you know, nobody's going to go for it. They didn't give it to me. Um, I don't have one. I never got one. You got to have that. Otherwise, that'll put you under a, a, a negative. Just it'll put you under a, a black cloud. So I go through classification. Obviously, I tell them I want to go out to the Northern Mexican, Northern Black Yard. Um, and I get clear for the yard. This was the first time going out to the six yard, the infamous six yard in 92, 90, 1992, yeah. I had always heard, of, you know, about the six yard. I had never touched down there. So, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't scared, obviously, man. I mean, I, I'd already been through prison. I already seen and done all that. You know, uh, um, I was already laced up, like I said, but, you know, hearing about the six yard, I was somewhat, Excited to go out there and finally hit that yard, man. No. Um, so I remember the the first day that. So when you know I I, I went back in. Um, I don't want to get too detailed, man. But I went through the through the whole clearing process when I first got to the oil. You know, once I got situated, the homie shot me a, a, a kite, introduced himself. Hey, you know when you get situated, I'm gonna come down one time, shoot his line, and. Um, I got something for you. And, you know, I already knew what he meant. I had been to Susanville. I had been gotten at before like that. And I, I knew the I knew the routine. You know, you get somewhere, people are going to reach out to you and they're going to they're gonna touch base with you to, to clear you. It's a, it's the, it's a filtering process. Anyway, the thing about Quentin that's crazy, man, is, you know, you could fish with somebody in Quentin 20 to 30 cells down the fucking tier if you knew what you were doing. Because if you had like a big hole in your gate or you had like enough space up under there, I used, I see motherfuckers, man, they used to get uh, Louisiana hot sauce bottles full of water and you got to, you got to know how to do it, man. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a it has, it takes a little bit of ingenuity, you know what I'm saying? You got to put it out there and you use a, a braided up line and you'll throw it one way, you'll zip that motherfucker down this way, and then you'll zip it back and let the momentum carry it further. And then you, if you're going down this way, you zip it back down this way, and it, that motherfucker will fly down the tier, man. After, uh, you know, I became a, a professional fisher. I had my motherfucking license. I can fish. Shit, I can get a motherfucking fish line to a, a tier up above me. You motherfuckers think I'm bullshitting? I've done it. I'm telling you I'm a certified fucking fisherman. Check it out. I'm not going to get too off 
too too uh off offline here, but look, I'm gonna just tell you guys real quick. Those of you that been to San Quentin, if you've been to if you've been to like Carson section or East Block, so you know how in front of the, the cells you'll have bars, right? There's like four bars. It's just so a motherfucker can't swan dive off the you know, do a motherfucking swan dive off the tier. So those bars right there, what I would do is I would throw my line over the tier and then I'd yank it up and it would it would flip up onto that first bar and then I give it enough slack to where I yank it again and it go up to that second bar and then third bar fourth bar and finally get up onto I've done it before. So I got my motherfucking fisherman license. I was a certified fisherman. I can I can get down from fucking one end of East Block back bar to the front bar. No bullshit. <laughs> Anyway, man, no. some of you should get a kick out of that because you motherfuckers know what I'm talking about, man. I mean, sometimes we used to have to fish. There'd be no no relays in between, and you would have to get, you know, 15, 20, 20 cells down to reach, you know, one of the homies, man. But anyway, so after going through the, the NA process, getting cleared, going through all that, Going to classification, I remember the, the day that they were running the six yard. They were running yard for us. The six yard goes out. At that time, we were going out with the five yard, with the with the south siders in the woods. No, 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 I take that back. That would come later. We were going out with the integrated yard. So those guys would go out on opposite days. Anyway, I remember the first time I went out there, man, it was a hot ass day. And they started running yard, obviously by tiers. So when they came to the fourth tier where I was at, they'd already ran the first, second, third tier. So we, when they started running the fourth tier, there was already a lot of fucking homeboys out there on the yard already posted up. And the way that the the, the six yard is is an affiliated yard, it's it's regimented. Everything that's done out there is done by by policy and routine um you know you don't just go out to the yard and start smoking cigarettes start walking around st one of the most important parts or mo one of the most important times of the yard is the beginning of the yard when there's people coming in and out of that gate and the end of yard when people are going out of that gate so those are so th those are two of the most important part or most important times of the yard right there. So all movement is froze. When you come out to the yard, you fall right into formation. You will come and there might be like f a row of homeboys, there might be five of them. And you come and if there was three homies right here, you fall in line next and you just post up right there. You post up and then the next homeboy come out and he post up and then they start another line and the Africanos do the routine and it's real, it's real regimented like that. Nobody's talking, everybody's focused on the gate. And the reasons why is because there's always the possibility of them letting somebody that's not welcomed into the yard come through the gate. So there's no movement. It's all, we're all focused on that gate and everybody's just waiting until that last individual comes in and once once that last individual steps through then everybody breaks for formation and you know the embracements and the in the and the saludos go out and all that good stuff so that's that's how the yard was ran when i was going out there the first time i remember standing right there and you know we were kind of held up there's like a long a long row um, six yard is all the way at the end. So there's a long row. You got to walk past all the death row yards. One, one, two, three, four. All those first four yards are all death row. Five yard was integrated yard. And six yard was, was where we were at. So, you know, when you're walking down that, that row, down that line, you get to see all the, all these cats on death row. So I remember the first time I walked by there, checking them all out. They got weight piles out there and shit. There's Crips and Bloods. Tookie was out there. 
uh, you know, different yards, there's different affiliations and different categories, meaning classification wise. You got the Bay Area car on one, um, one yard, I believe they were on the three yard. The four yard was Death Row PC. The, the one yard was Tookie and his following. The two yard were other Crips, the East Coast Crips. And then you had like Fee, they used to go out to that yard with the Bloods. The Crips and the Bloods shared a yard out there. So, you know, you, 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 I remember walking by, looking at those yards. And because, you know, it takes so, you know, it takes a minute for them to let somebody in that gate. Because, again, I told you guys about this when I talked about how they let Tuna from Hayward out to the yard. And they let him out to the wrong yard and he got off. So, anyway... You know they can only run one person into the yard at a time, so it it, it takes a minute to 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 process each individual. Cause you go in, they shut the gate, you, you squat down, they take your cuffs off, and then you know you turn towards the yard you're gonna go to. They gotta take their keys. There's a little box. They gotta turn that, push a button, pop you in, shut it, lock it, boom, do the next individual. So you know it's a process. So I remember getting held back and I remember just looking at the six yard and I was kind of fascinated by how structured it was, how serious the, the I could feel the vibe out there was the, um, you know, I could feel it in the air, man. Uh, and, and again, I can't, I can't tell you guys how different it was from, from what I seen in the late nineties, man. It was, it, it was crazy. The, the morale was just, it was fucked up, man. In the past 96, 97, 98, then you had the whole fucking, the, uh, the, the disbandment of the NR 98, all that shit just, it, it tore the morale up. But anyway, finally, eventually I end up getting out there on the yard and, you know, I, we, 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 we did our thing out there. We ran Machina. Uh, again, I was just a little young NR member. First time being out there. It's probably one of the only times that I was on the yard and I didn't have, I wasn't the authority in charge. And I'm not saying that, you know, because I got a big head. It's just the honest truth. I had developed over the years, I developed leadership skills pretty fast, man. I think it was the second time I came in on a violation that night out from Los Baños, when he left, he left the keys to me. Um, this was my second on uh, my second violation. I wasn't expecting it, you know what I mean? But that's how fast that I had developed um leadership abilities, man. And, and obviously, you know, for, for the brother to have that kind of confidence and faith in me, he's seen something. You know what I mean? Anyway, so Nothing really happened. Nothing really uh, worth talking about. You know, the first time over there, I, I, I went through the bonds, the format, that kind of stuff. We did the glass on all that. It was the same stuff I basically went through in Susanville. The history, the NR history. This is when I started getting fed a little bit about the NF, what the NF was about, and, and, uh, and things like that. As far as anything else that really happened, I sat there. I was... They, they put me on a shelf for, I think I was there for like, I don't know, uh, two two months tops. The only incident that, that ended up happening was they let some cat out to our yard that was no good. And he was a slouch. He was a slouch. He wasn't, he wasn't a threat. He was just somebody that was was no good for whatever reason. I don't even remember what it was about, man. But I remember uh, Night Owl, um, a different Night Owl, had told me that that individual was going to get, we were going to remove him. And they didn't hit him. They didn't hit him with a weapon. It was just at the end of the yard, uh, they caught him to the back of the yard, and a homeboy bombed on him, bombed on him real quick. And... Uh, <laughs> They bombed on him, and homeboy walked to the gate. He walked to the gate, and um, 
told the gunner, hey, I need to get off the yard. His mouth was bleeding. The gunner was like, what the fuck happened? He was like, oh, shit. Okay, I see what time it is. So that's the only thing that really happened there. That was the only thing that really happened that's really uh, worth talking about, man. Other than that, I just waited until I caught the bus. Now, here's here's where it starts to get good. And I'm probably not going to cover all this because... I want I want to get uh, kind of detailed into this because it's it's for one it's funny but for two it's it was a learning curve for me what what ended up happening to me so anyway I stay there for about two months I catch it they put me on a bus and I take that first eight hour fucking long ass miserable bus ride to Pelican Bay it was in ninety two it's the first time going up there so. You know, even even the bay was different. How they used to do things back back in those days. You used to have to go through like an orientation thing when you first got to the bay, before you went back to uh, the other blocks. Like you'd have to go to one block and you'd have to stay there for like thirty days, and then after that thirty days, then they shoot you to another block where you were you were gonna be housed at. So it was it was crazy. It was different. Anyway, um. At that time, in 92, the first the first block I went to was D7. I went to D facility, and they put me in 7 block. I had heard about Pelican Bay. I heard all the stories like you guys, all the myths, but all that shit ended up being fucking uh, not true. I heard about all the myths. You know, the, the, the shower gets pushed to your fucking cell door. You read your mail over a TV screen. All that shit, man. Your food, um, you know, the, the, your food comes uh, flying to you on a fucking uh, uh, on a on a tray that has fucking uh, um, uh, jet packs. You know what I mean? I heard all kind of fucking bullshit stories. Um, I heard all kind of bullshit stories about. Pelican Bay. Anyway, so I get up there. I get to Seven Block. Don't know anybody. At that time, Pelican Bay was a war zone. It was on and cracking. There was no door policy in effect. We were told if the doors crack, you're to come out and handle your business. It's 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 on with the Southsiders and the Woods. No questions asked. Shout out to the Southsiders. Shout out to the Woods. You guys already know, man. So. I get there in that pod and there's nobody there. There's no homeboys there. There was only one cat that was a, he was a Tejano. His name was uh, Ramiro, Ramiro Lujan from Modesto. They called him Bandit. Straight Tejano. Fucking Cowboys fan. And, he, you know, he gave me the, he gave me the ins and outs of the pod. Let me know who was there and all that. But there was no, there was like, there really wasn't no homies there to really get at me and, and, you know, tell me who else was in the block or what the program was, what the policies were over there. I was in that pod all by myself and basically had to figure it out by myself. There were there were, there were Mexican mafia members in that pod and there were a lot of Sureños in that pod and there were ABs in that pod. I was by my motherfucking self behind enemy lines but at that time i was you know my mindset was it's all good you know the the, the gates crack um it's on and cracking you ain't got to tell me i already know man but you know i was educated i was laced up the right way i had respect man i didn't go in there with my chest po po poked out i didn't go in there mean mugging motherfuckers and all that i went in there and you know send my respects to everybody in the pod introduce myself and, um, you know, basically let them cats know that I was from Northern California and I was active. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they reciprocated that respect. They, I got there, obviously I didn't have nothing. So, you know, the Southsiders reached out and um, they didn't have to give me like my necessities because the Tejano did that. But, you know, they, they, uh, and they seen that he took care of me. If he wasn't there, they probably would have shot me like, hey, Box, here's some toothpaste, some deodorant, here's some, some uh, warichi, some coffee, um, writing material, stationery, all that. But 
you know, they seen he, he had me covered, so they just, they, you know, they, they offered me some books, some reading material, um, and whatnot. And we conversated to an extent. It was still kind of weird a little bit. You know, and I was young, and there were some young Southsiders in there that uh, it were a little different. So it it was um, it was cool, man. It was nothing but respect. But like I said, there was no door policy in effect, and I knew that if the doors opened up, that I was required to come out, torpedo out, and get my money, man. So you know, I had a routine in there. I was like, man. I'm not gonna get caught slipping up in this bitch, man. Um, so every day I used to roll my mattress up. I used to roll it up anyway. That was part of the program. But I used to roll it up, have it tied up, and I'd ha I'd be sitting by the door, by my door, especially during shower programs or when they were running the yard, because those are the times when either you got a gunner that is not paying attention to what he's doing and he might hit the wrong button, or you just got a gunner that's just bored and wants to see some action. But either way. If it's going to happen, more than likely, that's when it's going to happen. A lot of times, they run haircuts and nail clippers and shit like that on the tier. There might be somebody sitting on the stairs cutting their nails, or they might be down there by the mirror, um, which is kind of like a little blind spot where the where the control booth's at, and he might not see him, and he might pop you out. So, anyway, I was all, all, always posted, and... Being that they were active, I'm sure they seen that. When they would come up to shower, they were probably make, taking mental notes that, okay, this cat, he's sitting by his door with his mattress rolled up. They knew I was active, but like, okay, you know, he's with the shit. You know what I'm saying? He's with the functions, man. Just like, uh, you know, I, I evaluated everybody in that pod and, uh, you know, have profiles on, on all them cats as well who... Who, who I I deemed as a threat, a possible threat, and who I looked at as, like, you know, he's not really a threat, you know what I mean? Um, or he's probably low low at the, t at the totem pole as far as their, their um, you know, their their uh, seniority or whatever, how, whatever you want to call it, man. Um, so, anyway, for the first couple months, it was just me and the Tejano. It was just me and him, man, and, and there was one other individual. I'm going to tell you guys about this one individual, and then I'll, the next episode is when I'll get into the crux of this shit, what really happened that was a valuable learning learning lesson for me. So anyway, once I was there for a minute and I got to know who, who was in the pod, so there were one, two, three, four... Five, six. There were all four cells on the bottom. No, no, three cells on the bottom were Southsiders and Mexican Mafia members. One cell, there was two ABs. On the on the upper tier, I was in the first cell, 209. There were there were two Southsiders in the cell next to me. And then next to them, you had two more Southsiders, just Sureños. And then you had the Tejano at the end down there. So, no, 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 no. Let me, let me say that again. I was in 209. I was in the first cell. There were two Sureños next door to me. And then next to them, there was one, what I thought was a Sureño. And then there were uh, the Tejano. So, after getting there, after a while, after being there for a while, like a month, I started to take notice of the individual that was two doors down. He had Asian um, tattooed on his stomach. His name was Ray Hernandez. I believe his last name was Hernandez. And, you know, I never heard him talk about where he was from, but I always heard him talk a lot about the Bay Area. So it piqued my interest, man, and... Um, Eventually, I, I I found out through Bandit, just from talking to him, because he was the porter, so he used to come out and kick it on the tier. But he told me one day when he was out, he was like, hey, that, that cat down there, Ray, he's from Hayward. He's from Hayward, and 
he's 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 a Mexican mafia sympathizer, and apparently from what Bandit told me is he was setting up homeboys on the yards on the main lines to get victimized by the Mexican mafia and the Southsiders. So I was like, really? I had never spoke to that individual, especially after that. I I you know at at most. I would walk by and just give him his general respect. I'd nod at him and that was it. All right, bro, you know, that that was it. The other Sureños in there, the woods, it, it was it was real limited on, on, on talking at that time, but there was communication. You know, the, the woods, hey, hey, Box, you know, I got this book, it's a good book, because I didn't have nothing. I was the only one in there that didn't have a TV, so everybody in there's watching TV, or they got radios, it took me a while before I got my TV and shit. So they'd offer me books and shit like that. But that individual, we never conversated. So check it out. So one day, one day the, the one of the COs, the floor officer, came into the pod. And anytime that front gate opens, I'm, I'm on my gate. Any kind, any kind of movement in, that's going on in the pod, I'm on it. So, you know. I get up on my gate and I see the CO come walking in. He walks up the stairs, comes around the corner. I see him come down and he comes straight to my cell and he's like, at this time too, Ray, the individual that's two, two doors down, he's on the yard. He's out there on the yard doing his yard time, right? He's getting his hour in and shit. So the CO, it's dead ass quiet in there. It's dead fucking quiet. When a CO comes on the tier, it, the, the tier goes quiet. Usually, I mean, you don't got no speaker in there anyway. When you're in the shoe program and you have you get appliances, when your TV comes in, they cut the fucking speaker out in R&R. They cut the speaker out or they, at least they cut the wires. So they used to just cut the wires and motherfuckers used to find ways to connect them motherfuckers, you know what I mean, with little prongs and shit. But then they just, they got hit to that, so they start taking the whole fucking speaker up. But they do that because they want it quiet back there, so you have to listen to your TV through headphones. But what we used to do, not to get too off, off track here, but what we used to do is we used to just get like a magazine. We used to just get like a magazine, and I'm just showing you guys real quick. We get like a thick piece of magazine and you make a cone like that that's just a real rough a real fucking rough cop and then you take your your cone and you stick it in this little end and this would this would act as like a, a, a conducer like a like a speaker so when you plug your your headphones in it it was like a little conductor it would fucking be you know be kind of loud you could hear it in that pot um motherfuckers used to bump um, BET all the time, man. Rap City and shit. Anyway, so when the CO came in, he came up to my, my door. Everybody turned their shit down so they could hear it. They want to hear what the fuck this CO's doing at my door. He tells me, he's like, hey, he's like Mendoza. He was like, um, check it out. We got a bus coming in tonight. We're fucking packed out. We don't got no room. He's like, this guy right here, um, and I think he was 211. I was in. 209 so i think he was 211 he's like uh hernandez in 211 can you sell up with them and i was like absolutely 100 percent, yeah absolutely and he was like um okay would would you rather uh move down to that cell or would you rather him come over here i said whatever you guys want to do i'm fine with it um yeah you know we're both northerners so yes yeah, it's, it's all good man so he leaves he walks away and i'm like ooh. I'm about to get it in right now, man. I'm a, I'm a fucking uh, man. I'm, 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 I'm gonna obliterate this dude, especially knowing that he set up homeboys. Oh man, you know, I was, I was in there pumped up, like, okay, damn, I'm about to get it in, man. Uh, I wonder how it's gonna go down. So the CEO comes down the stairs. He hooks a corner and he goes to the yard gate. And now he's got to yell through the yard door. So he's got to talk loud and Ray has to talk loud. So everybody's listening. When he came to my gate and he asked if me and him could sell up, I know everybody in that pod was looking at each other like, oh, these fools about to get it. 
they about to get it right now, man. So now everybody's listening to what he's saying. And I can hear the CEO tell him, hey, hey Hernandez, the like, same thing he tells me. We got a bus coming in, you know, uh, uh, we need we need sales space. So um, is it okay if uh, we sell you and Mendoza up in 209? And I don't hear what he says. I can't hear him, man. Oh, he was talking low or he was like, they got like a little... A little circle thing on the door on the yard with like a little four little holes in it and if you talk through it I guess you can hear if you're close up to the door he's talking through that I know everybody else is trying to hear him too they want to know what the fuck's going on so it's a trip this is this this is a trip right here so I don't know what he told him but the CEO he takes off walks back out of the pod and uh, door shuts right when the door shuts, um, I yelled down to to Bandit. I said, hey, Bandit. He was like, yeah, what's up, homie? I was like, hey, did you hear that? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I just want to make sure you heard it, bro. And he was like, oh, no, no, I heard it. So right after that, Ray calls Yard Recall. He tells, he tells uh, the Southsiders downstairs, hey, can you let them know I'm ready to come in? So boom. Gun, Gunner pops Ray in. He walks in the in the pod. I'm I'm watching him. I'm watching all movement now. It's like I'm looking at him like a motherfucking lion looks at a little fucking baby deer, man. That's my my breakfast right there. <laughs> no, for real. I just I'm watching it and I'm listening because I wanted now you know my awareness is fucking peaking right now. Like I know I'm about to get him up with this dude, and I want to know everything that I can about everything involved so you know I'm, I'm listening and watching everything going on around me um so instead of him coming up like he normally always does instead of him coming up to his door and because at that time in 92 you used to have to strip out in front of your cell on the tier in order to go to yard or you'd have to come down to the gate and strip down right there you had to strip out that's I don't I, I didn't it wasn't no sense in doing it. You had a pedazo, they'd never be able to see it from that fucking far away. I guess they just don't like to humiliate motherfuckers, right? So his routine, his normal, regular routine, like everybody else's, would be to come up the stairs and go and do it in front of his cell. However, he came in off the yard, he went to the front of the pod, and he went to the gate and he called the CO. Hey CO, hey. CO, yeah, what's up? Hey, can you come over here? Can I can I have a word with you? So I'm now I'm really listening. I want to hear everything this motherfucker's gonna say. So CO comes over. He's whispering. He whispers to him. And this is check this out, man. Just so you guys know. He uh he was on their roll call. He was on the Southsiders roll call. They embraced this dude like he was one of theirs. I actually thought he was a Southsider. Before I knew anything about his history, before Bandit told me what time it was with him, I thought he was a Southsider. On their roll call, when they go to sleep, when there's noches, uh, he that's who he used to, you know, conversate with. He would interact with just them. So I'm like, he's Southsider, you know. But he was from the north. He was from up north, but he was one of those cats that were working with. The, the Mexican Mafia or working with the Southsiders. Um, so anyway, he uh, whatever he told the CO on the gate, I don't know. I don't. I, I couldn't hear, but I I knew. I was saying to myself, this dude just fucking told them to kill that move, and I know his fucking people. They're all watching and they all seen that dude bitch out right now. No fucking doubt about it. I can even tell by when he turned around from the gate, the look on his face was like, I can't explain it to you guys. He just, he looked like he had done something. He got caught doing something that he shouldn't, shouldn't be caught. He shouldn't be doing. And he, now he had to face the rest of the pod. That's the kind of look he had on his face. The best way I could describe it. He sent his saludos to, to the guys downstairs when he was coming up, but they fucking knew. And he knew. 
He as much as he tried to hide it on his face, he knew. But check it out, it gets better soon. He goes to his cell. He stripped. He's or he struck. He stripped out by the by the door. He goes to his cell. He goes in. Boom. He's done. Right. They run the next yard out. Boom. Um, I wait about a couple minutes. I wait a couple minutes, and then I yell down there to him. I yell down to him. I tell him. I say, "Hey Ray," and I've never talked to this dude before. Never, never said a word to this dude. He's like, "Yeah, what's up?" I said, "Hey bro." I said, "Um, so uh, uh, uh the CEO he rapped to you about that about that cell move, right?" And he was like, "He was like, oh yeah, yeah." I said, "Well, check it out, bro." I said, um, how are we gonna do this, bro? You gonna come down here? You want me to come down there? And uh, he was like, oh, um, he's like, I, 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 you can come down here. Um, and I was like, all right, man, I'm just, I'll be down there, bro. You know what I mean? As soon as they rack the gates, I'm coming down. And he was like, all right. I knew though that he killed that move. I, I knew he did, man, and everybody else in the pod knew. They continue to embrace him. They continue to keep him on their roll call. It's just like something that happened that nobody spoke. They, nobody spoke on it. Nobody addressed it, but everybody knew. And um, you know, prior to that, he kind of he kind of had this aura about himself. You know, this he tried to portray himself as this 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 type of individual that was. You know, a real serious type of dude, and that just shit all over him. Um, it fucked his character up. He was broken after that. Um, I hope I'm explaining it to you guys right. That's the best way I can put it in, in perspective for you. Uh, after that, he wasn't trying to be that fucking tough guy, that super sadio fucking guy that he he was trying to be before that incident because. He got caught with his pants down. That happened to me one other time, man. One other time. And I'm going to give you guys just this little bonus because I'm going to close this up right here. Um, we never said a word to each other after that. They obviously did not do the cell move that night. They never came and asked me anything else about it. They never came and mentioned nothing about it. To him, nothing. they just didn't do the move. I would end up staying there for... Um, a few more months and you know the, the the rest of this I'm gonna save for the next episode and that's really the crux of this whole story is what happened when they would bring in two individuals that would claim to be Nuestra Familia members two of them um, two older cats it became a valuable learning lesson for me it was something that I'll never forget it was something that It, it taught me a valuable lesson. I'll just put it like that. So I'm going to talk about that in episode 26. But let me just tell you guys this this other incident that, that happened to um, with that a similar situation like that happened. I was in San Francisco County Jail. I was in, I was locked up in the oil for getting into it with an outsider. And there, there was a Southsider that was on the tier that was, was kind of a, a good sized dude. And same situation, man. Not, not, it wasn't, I'm not going to say it was really the same because the situation that happened in Pelican Bay, it was a different environment, whole different, um, it was a lot different. But this individual, you know, it was like, I was only back there for like five days. That's how long they used to lock you up whenever you get into a fist fight, unless you stab somebody, five days. So this individual, I moved to the tier. Obviously, he knew I was a Norteño. I knew he was a Sureño. One of the C, one, a CO that was working that night, almost accidentally let this dude in my cell. And this is how it went down. It was funnier than shit, man, because this dude was a pretty, he was a pretty good sized dude. But the CO came, the, he came back from an attorney visit or something. It was an attorney visit or some type of regular visit. I don't know. But he was coming back. And when, when I was sitting in the cell drawing or I was doing something, and the CO walked up to my gate and pulled his key out and stuck it in my fucking gate. And he, he looked, he goes, hey, you ready? 
uh, uh, he's like, you, you're right here. You are you housed right here? And the dude was like, yeah. And he goes, this is your celly? And I said, yeah. And I stepped up and I came to the phone. Yeah, yeah, that's my celly, man. Let, yeah, let him up in there. And the CO was getting ready to turn the key. And the dude goes, nah, I'm not in. I don't live in there, man. My cell's down the way. I swear to God, when he seen that that fucking CO was getting ready to open up my gate, it couldn't be any clearer. He pissed on himself, man, 1,000 million percent. He couldn't have done it any more, um, any worse than what he did. He waited till the CO almost turned the key and he straight told him, no, I don't live there. He was like, I live down the street. I, I don't know. Maybe he was trying to call my bluff. Maybe he thought I wasn't gonna I wasn't game or that you know we weren't gonna we weren't gonna get him get it in, but he was wronger than shit. That door would have opened up, I'd have came up out of there like a motherfucking bat out of hell, man, like some motherfucking guamo. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed episode twenty five, man. Episode twenty six will be it's going to be a good one, man. It's going to be a good one. It's a it, it's a, a good lesson that I learned, and it's just something for some of you to trip on, man. Um, those are some of the, the type of shit that used to happen in Pelican Bay. And it's these types of things that used to happen to young North Daniels that would, would go into these types of environments that weren't prepared for being around crafty motherfuckers, man. But anyway, we're going to get into it on episode 26. With that said, man, this is Inner Demons, episode 25. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to try to hit you with the war stories, but we got plenty of content coming out tonight, man. All right, man. I appreciate you guys, man. With that said, I'm out.